this holy week. We're here in church in the middle of the week, and for everybody that's online, it's very, very important that some of the things I'm going to be sharing with you tonight, I need to put these things in perspective. We're going to look at the seven parables this night that Jesus gave in the last week of his life. Now, most of the times people get a little confused when they hear a parable. They try to make it fit in a certain way. You're going to see tonight, especially in several of these parables, you're going to say, well, wait a minute. How could that have happened while it was in heaven? A parable's main purpose is to teach you. It is to give like an allegory, and you'll hear the words like or as. And if it's not like or as, it's something like in, in this way, you know. So it's telling you a story that's trying to teach you something. So when something seems like it doesn't fit within the parable, it fits within the teaching of the subject. So here we go here tonight. Let me share with you again the opening statement here. These are, these are Jesus' last week's prophecies. And how interesting. There's not five. There's not six. There's not four. There's not eight. There's seven parables. Do you think that's by chance? No. When seven is the perfect complete number, he wanted to give a complete teaching of things that the disciples, the apostles, and you and I for generations to come, things that we would need to know. So tonight, you're going to see that actually this takes us through a chronological journey of all things. Isn't that amazing? From all the parables. So we start, since we're, we're in the book of Mark, read verses 1 through 11, and then we're going to look at this. We're not going to spend a lot of time in, in all these because we're doing seven parables here tonight. The last three you know very well, so I'm going to give you something hopefully new that you didn't know about them, and we're not going to read the scriptures of them. The scriptures are in your study guide, and you can read them at home, the last three, because I knew time would be going. Here we go, Mark chapter 12. Jesus then began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from some of the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others. Some of them they beat, and others they killed. He had one left to send, a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, they will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? Watch this. This is very, this is... This is not the Jesus of the New Testament that many Christian churches are teaching about. This is not the God that they're teaching about. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Oh my. Haven't you read the passage of the scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it's marvelous in our eyes. This is one of the more misunderstood parables, and it lends to a false theology that is throughout a lot of Protestant. Sadly, it started again in the roots of Catholic Church. Now, I'm not picking on the Catholics. I have, I was born, you're born Catholic. You don't join the Catholic Church. You're born Catholic. I was born Catholic, and my mother was born Catholic. We went to Catholic school and all those different things, so I'm not picking. I'm just telling you, you can't trust what 
people say. You have to trust what the Word of God says in this. All right, so let's look at this parable in here. And it, first off, verses 1 through 8 tells us that Jesus is a non-religious Messiah. He didn't come to start a new religion called Christianity. He came to build his church. The church would be the people of God. It wouldn't be a structure, though they would come to a structure to gather under the headship of him, that he's the head of the church. You and I are the church. He actually challenged the Jewish leaders all the days of his life that he was in his three and a half years of ministry, he was challenging the Pharisees with what they were doing in perverting the law and changing the law to lord over people. He was not a friend of the religious person. Though he did want to woo them, they didn't want him. That's what this parable says, that they rejected him. He's the son. All the people before that, that's the Old Testament, the prophets that were all coming before Jesus, and it was how they treated him. Now, I'm going to give you a word. It's worth writing down. 99.9% .9 of Catholics believe in replacement theology. 70% of Protestants, no matter what denomination you came from, believe in replacement theology. Okay? What is replacement theology? Well, first let me tell you this. Jesus came to show that your religion, whether you're Catholic, whether you're a Jewish Pharisee, whether you're a Protestant in a leadership of a denominational stuff, your righteousness of yourself and your observance of your rules or of your denomination or even observance of the law does not get you into heaven. Amen. The righteous one came to die for us, and that is the only path to heaven. Amen. So, the replacement theology goes like this. The Jews messed up, so God replaced it with the church. That's what replacement theology says. It's the most incorrect theology that you can have. Let me give you how it really worked, and he tells us this in verses 9 through 11. Jesus gave God's mission to 12 non-religious, but, watch this, this is your fill in the blank in here, all right, they were all Jewish. He didn't replace, he, he started in his church. It hasn't hit the Gentiles yet, so the church wasn't the replacement, okay? He gave the mission that the Jews said, we don't want you as our king, God. Can we have one that we can see? And so what we learned in Hosea, he said, out of his anger, he gave him a king. And as out of wrath, he killed those kings, especially all those in the northern kingdom that were now doing idolatrous things and the nine dynasties that were in the northern kingdom. That's what we just finished in the book of Hosea. So you can see that Jesus didn't come to start a religion. He didn't pick. He didn't go to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He picked 12 non-religious leaders. How interesting. To start his kingdom here on earth. It's called the church. It is also called the family of God. It's called the bride of Christ. And he is the head of the body, the body of Christ. Okay, So these are all the analogies of who these people, the people of God, are at this juncture. All right, He didn't replace the nation of Israel with the church. You got to read John chapter 1, verses 9 through 13. He came to his own, his own rejected him. He still sticks with the Jews as the leaders that are going to be the leaders of the church, the body of Christ. And he's going to grow his kingdom. It is not a replacement that the church replaced Israel. Israel is on a path. Everything in the future that we're coming to is geared towards Israel. The path for the church is coming to an end. The church age is almost closed. 
It's called the fullness of the Gentiles. Yes, when Paul got saved, he was trying to kill the body of Christ because he was the Jew of all Jews, and he said, I'm going to put, I'm going to, put to death all those that are starting up this false movement until Jesus knocked him off his high horse and the scales fell from his eyes and he becomes the most dynamic missionary for the body of Christ. Isn't that interesting? That gives us hope, doesn't it? So if you've been against Jesus, if, you, if you've been against the church, you're, you're, you're actually more in line with Jesus. He's, he's not against the church, but he didn't come to start a religious organization. Okay? The church in its proper sense is the body of Christ, the bride of Christ in this. So the church was not plan B. It was the hidden plan. There it is. Where do you find that? In Ephesians chapter 3, verses 8 and 9 and verse 10, that he's revealing what was there all along. His plan was that the Son would come, and the Son would then anoint and train those leaders that would then establish his kingdom. When his apostles said, well, we don't know how to pray, he said, let me tell you how to pray. Lord, help the first church of whatever this church is. No, that's not how he told them how to pray, huh? Well, Lord, bless that this denomination that we're starting right now is going to be the denomination that everybody will follow. That's not how he did He said, pray in this manner. Our Father, see, it's the relational here, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. He taught them how to pray about the kingdom. Folks, he, what, every Catholic, you don't know this, when you're praying that Our Father's Prayer, don't pray the Hail Mary Prayer. We're not supposed to pray to people that are fully human. Okay? She's not divine. She's not the Immaculate Conception. Jesus is the only one born without sin. I'll fix everything on the way here tonight. I'm going to fix all of Christianity tonight. I have no power to do that, folks. Trust me. That was being facetious and funny, I hope. So but when, he, when you pray, thy kingdom come, you're praying about his kingdom being established here on earth where he's coming back. For those that he never left, they left him. God never leaves you nor forsake you. Know your Bible. He never leaves you nor forsake you. Will he let judgment and wrath come upon your sinful choices? Will they have consequences? Absolutely, unless they're washed and you're cleansed totally from them. This parable reinforces the story of God's plan of salvation for the whole world. For God so loved the Jews, but when they messed up, they switched to plan B, the church. That's what God... That's what replacement theology is teaching. They're not that rough over it. They try to tell you why this is so important. It's faulty Bible understanding. And it starts right here in the very first parable in here. And so he's telling you how it all worked. And verse 11 of that parable ended with, The Lord has done this, and it's marvelous in our eyes. It's a marvelous plan, isn't it? Yes. Amen. Amen. Well, now we get to the, to the second parable. In the second parable, it's the, the parable of the wedding banquet. This also is a, the Catholics don't understand it, and probably 70% of Protestants don't understand this one. Isn't it interesting? If you, now, let me, let me give you some stuff that's going to be in your notes here, right up front here. If you go through this portion of, of this, you're going to see... Out of the seven parables, all seven are in Matthew. Okay, this is in your, through the parable of the wedding banquet, we get insights to the rapture here and the wedding banquet in heaven. All seven of the parables are told in Matthew. They start in Matthew 21. Now, we started in Mark because only certain ones are in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. As a matter of fact, only two of the seven are in all three. Isn't that interesting? But all seven are chronological. You've got to remember, the Gospels have a different messenger for what the Messiah was. We're in Mark. 
Mark is teaching Jesus as the Messiah and the servant. We finished Luke last year, and it was teaching Jesus as the Messiah and the Son of Man, humanity, his humanity. John teaches that Jesus is the Messiah, and he's divine, his divinity. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. He's always been, he's been divine. Matthew is Jesus is the Messiah, and he's the king. And the king sets down this order. So if you, if you don't want to go through Mark in this, go back to Matthew 21. You'll see the parable of the tenets there. You'll pick up a few extra little things that you can question and look at these things, and you'll go through this. This is very important. Let's look at the parable in itself, verses 2 through 14. Are you being able to hang with me so far? All right. How many say it's as clear as mud? All right. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come. Watch this. This is the most audacious statement. Who's, who's inviting the common everyday people, inviting the guests? The king. The king. Not a king. The king. And here, look at these words. But they refused to to come. Folks, those that don't make it to heaven is because they refuse to go there. Amen. He's not sending anybody there. They chose to reject him. Very interesting truths there, aren't they? Okay. Then he sent some more servants and said, tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle have been butchered, and everything's ready. Wow. It's, it's prepared. The banquet is ready. It's a wedding banquet. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field and another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. Say, what? Wow. The king was enraged. Folks, you should always underline when God's saying he is enraged that there is the wrath coming forth there. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Again, we're just in the second. This is Jesus' last week of life. In the first one, we're seeing the God that most of the Protestant church doesn't talk about, the the God that says, if you do this, I'm coming and I'm going to treat you this way because you're showing you have no respect for who I am as God. And here he says this. Then he said to his servants, he, he just sent an army, right? Go back and do verse 7 again. Back to that. The king was enraged and he sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Wow. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite the banquet to anyone you find. I love that. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guest, he noticed that there was a man that was not wearing wedding clothes. The clothes will... This is the symbol of the clothes. The clothes, if you're dressed in white, you're dressed in righteousness, his righteousness. This man was not wearing those wedding clothes, all right? So he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him, tie him hand and foot, and throw him outside into the darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. Now, ooh, the tenant story is very, very important. The tenant story is told, it, it, as we get in, into your notes here, the tenant story is, is very, very important to this aspect that you're going to see that when God gives an invitation, that invitation is always good. Now, this is where the story, if, if this represents 
we're raptured in heaven and we're at the banquet, how did that guy get there? That's faulty thinking. That's trying to make the parable be chronological, lit uh, uh, a, a literal translation of all that. That last part with the man who's not dressed properly refers to what happened on earth. Okay, This is the parable in your notes here. Let me just go through here. This is the parable of the wedding banquet that gives you the insights to the rapture. The refusal is what's happening in so many churches. The Catholic Church will not teach on a rapture. 70% of Protestant churches will not teach on the rapture. That there is the, the king is having a wedding for his son, and he's sending his angels that will come in the clouds, and Jesus is going to come, and he's going to invite us, and they are refusing to go. It's not at that right moment. They've been refusing by not believing all along. It's safer to be a Christian and say, I don't know how all that works. I, it'll all pan out. I'm, I'm still learning. You're safer in that than to say that God's word is not God's word. Okay? This is very, very serious stuff. In verses 6 through 13, where he says he's in range, the concept is not talked about in the New Testament in most modern-day churches. You don't hear about God being enraged. Remember, the parable is using to teach a point here. The point is, you don't get into heaven on your own righteousness. The man that shows up the wedding thing and he's dressed in his own clothes, the, in that day, when a king would invite in their culture, when you came to the wedding, they would have wedding clothes for you to put on. You didn't have, if you were poor and you were invited to it, they would give you the wedding clothes so you would be dressed properly for the wedding in that day. When you get to heaven, it's not in the filthy rags of your unrighteousness. You get to heaven clothed in the righteousness of God. And that's what, again, this didn't actually happen in heaven, though he's giving you, the, when he says, throw them out in the darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, that term, the weeping and gnashing of teeth, is only used in hell. Okay? So again... Don't try to make everything literal. He's doing a teaching here about the wedding banquet that we'll go to when Jesus comes and gets us and that will be clothed properly. Those that don't go, it's because they refused or that they didn't have the righteousness of God. They were self-righteous. They said, oh, I can go to the banquet and I can go believing and wearing what I have. I don't have to believe all the things that God has in his word. It's a scary stance to take. Again, this is in, he's going to be dying. He, he rides in on Sunday, on the 10th, and on the 14th, he's hanging on the cross. He has in this last few days to share what's most important, and he's given us a chronological, he takes us all the way through the first parable, takes us through how the, they dealt with, the Jews dealt with the prophets and his son, and he's showing you how we as the people of God, how we even approach the parable of his teaching about the rapture and his wedding banquet. All right, so the last statement here is a very interesting one. We, we use this a lot of times in a calling to ministry. This is not for a calling of ministry. This is a calling to the kingdom. Many are invited Few will answer the invite. Jesus taught it all the way along. The churches that say everybody gets to go to heaven, you don't know this. Many are invited, but few will answer the invite. The way is not wide. It is narrow. This is what we need to know. This should get people's attention how important this message that there's a wedding day out there in our future and we get there through the rapture. When the king says, it's time for the wedding banquet, he sends his son, and the angels come in the air. They don't come to the ground, but we get caught up with him. Those that are dead, 
rise before us, and in a twinkle of an eye, we that are alive get changed. All right, the next one, trust me, we're going to get through all these, and you're not going to be here till 9 o'clock, I promise. 8.15 is still my goal. All right, we're going to do two in one sitting right here. They're both in Matthew chapter 24. As a matter of fact, let me tell you how the rest of this works out. Out of the next five, two are in Matthew 24, and three are in Matthew 25. Remember, when you start at Matthew 21, you're already in the chronological. If you look before Matthew 21, you'll see the triumphal entry. In his last week of life, he gives these seven. So many are told in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, only two of the parables out of the seven. Several are told in one and then either Matthew or in Luke, okay, uh, Mark or Luke. All seven are in Matthew. Let's look at these two together. It's the parable of the fig tree and the parable of what some call it the faithful servant, the faithful master and servant. I think that title is confusing. Again, man put the title to it. In, in this, I put, it's really the parable of the thief. I named it myself because of what takes place in it. Let's look at the first one, the fig tree. By the way, the fig tree is in all three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, this lesson from the fig tree, as soon as the twigs get tender and leaves come out, you know that summer is near. You just learned a new phrase, learn the lesson. So he's now going to give it as a parable instead of saying like or as or in the same way. Learn the lesson is what the NIV uses in that. Even so, when you see all these things, you will know that it is near right at the door. Did you notice that it talked about that the summer is near before this happens? Remember, that's what it said in the very first part of it. Can you take some of these things literal? I'm going to throw something out to you here in just a moment. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. All right, that's the parable of the fig tree. We're going to look at it with the parable of the thief because I believe both parables deal with the timing of what's to come. Verse 42, okay. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect him. Let's talk about first these parables. They deal with timing. Let's go back to the parable of the fig tree. The fig tree is the parable that the summer is near, could be the key to the event. The fig tree is when it blossoms, it blossoms before, just like most trees in the springtime, and you know that when you see the leaves and the figs, summer is near. Many eschatologists wonder, does the parable have a insight to the timing of when Jesus will return. Because of the parable that follows it right here of the parable of you don't know what hour he's going to come. So this one, the fig tree again, is in Matthew, it's in Mark, and it's in Luke. In the parable of the faithful servant, we're moving to that one, when he says if the owner of the house knew what time the thief would come, and in your notes I put, so in this one, the parable of the faithful, many take this, this parable in that, who is the thief? It's kind of a twist on it all. Most of the time we'd say, well, the thief is the one who comes to steal, kill, and destroy, right? No, in this parable, the thief is Jesus. He's coming as a thief in the night. And so this connects with 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. There's like this paradox switch. The thief is Jesus because he's coming to take. But Thessalonians says he's not coming like a thief for those that know him. It'll be a thief for those that refuse to believe about the rapture. It'll be a thief to those that don't believe in a wedding banquet. It'll feel like a thief to them. 
So in the first part of this parable, Jesus is the thief. He uses that to give you a timing aspect. If that master would have known when the thief was coming, he would have been alerted to and ready for it. Jesus is saying there are many that don't know the timing. You do. You're seeing the timing in the parables he gives. So what's the teaching? The fig tree before summer. Let me give you something you might never have heard. Most of people that know something about end times, they always think it's going to happen around the trumpet feast in the fall. But is it possible when he gives this timing, no one knows the day or the hour? You got to put in the first Thessalonians chapter five, verses one through six there. He says, that's only to the children of darkness, but you're not of the darkness. You're children of the light. Oh, that's going to come into play here on, on our very next parable is the parable of the ten virgins. Five of them have light and five of them don't. Okay, so 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, he says, you're not of the darkness. He's not going to come like a thief to you. You're children of the day. You're children of the light. Now, since he gave the fig tree as part of the timing, and he says, it, you'll know summer is near. Guess what feast happens as summer is near? Pentecost. Pentecost. Now, since you know most of these, we're going to go into this. Let's, let's go ahead and put up the, the parables in Matthew 25 that give us the future sequence of the end game. That's what I'm going to call the uh, chapter 25, the end game. Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13, is the parable of the ten virgins. Five of them have enough oil, enough light, for when, remember we learned about the Galilean wedding on Sunday, that when the father sends the son, he's going to come and you have to be ready. You have to have enough oil in your lamp. The oil is symbolic of the spirit. You have to be filled with the spirit. But I also think the Oil can be a literal, literal. They used oil lamps to see. I think he's saying those that are children of the darkness that don't understand, and it'll be like a thief in the night to them, they don't see the scriptures in what I'm teaching, and he's teaching this in his last days. Now, watch. I'm going to put all the pieces together. Watch Connect the Dots. The fig tree. You'll know summer is near. Hmm, the only feast out of the seven is Pentecost that comes after Passover before the summer that the summer is when the fig leaves and then he says and if the if the household the master of the household knew at what time the thief would come he would have been prepared well the households that don't study the scriptures it'll be like darkness and like a thief but you are children of the day, the light. You're now in that we're not going to read the scriptures of the, of the parable of the ten virgins. You have enough oil, enough of the spirit. You trust the word of God. You believe in the full word of God. You're full of oil that you say, if he wrote it, it's all good. Amen. Okay? Now watch. Half of them won't get there. Five are foolish. That's 50%. Now, if he was speaking literally, again, he's not. He's speaking in a parable. If you speak, it's saying half the church, those that think they're going to heaven, aren't ready. How interesting when he says all the way back here that the fig leaves, it will come when summer is near, the fig tree will blossom. Pentecost. When you see Pentecost on June 5th, go out and look at the moon. When it lines up with the Jewish calendar, some years it doesn't. Just like if Resurrection Sunday didn't line up because the Catholic Church switched when this happens so that it would fall at a certain times, it doesn't always line up with the Jewish calendar. This year it does. When Pentecost falls on June 5th this year, and you go out and you look at the moon, you're going to see a 50% moon because it's 50 days from resurrection. 
Hmm, it's not a full moon, it's a 50% moon. Wait a minute, is this a sequence? You have to decide. When the fig tree is in blossom and the summer is near, the next event is the Spirit came down. Hmm. Does Jesus, this is just, I'm just doing this to test you because no one knows the day or the hour. Is Jesus going to pick up where the Spirit left off? The last thing for the church was the Spirit came. Is Jesus going to come at the 50% mark in the sky? Because half the church doesn't even believe. They refuse to believe in the wedding banquet. They refuse to believe in the rapture. And half of them aren't going to be ready. They don't have the light to actually see the scriptures. Because their pastors and their, their priests won't teach the scriptures. Are you, did, did I connect the dots better this time? You see in this? He put all this together. 50% will not be ready. Then he moves from the rapture again. This is what, that's what the ten virgins is all about. So we have a, a parable about they refuse to go. That's about the rapture and the wedding banquet. Now they're going to the banquet again. We're back at the rapture part of it. And those that go, and those that go, oh, I remember we heard some guys speak about that. We heard some pastors say that. Oh, uh, Maybe it's not too late. Lord, Lord, I've, I've loved you. I've, I've done all these things. I've, I've cast out demons in your names. I've fed the poor. I've done all these different things. And he's going to be at the door. He says, no, it's too late. I don't know you. I don't know you because you refuse to believe my word. You refuse to have light on the word. This is the instructions I left you. Yes, it was in a parables so you could get the teaching in the last week of my life. And the door is shut. they got to make it through the tribulation. Is there still hope for them? Yes. As long as you have breath. So if you're watching this in the future, as long as you have breath, and if we're not here, as long as you have breath, repent. Ask God to save you. Don't take the mark. And you can then move to full salvation. Hmm. Does the lamp signify the influence of the Holy Spirit? I believe so. But you have to decide. The next parable is the parable of the talents. It's a picture of what happens in heaven. Again, something falls out that doesn't seem to make sense. The first two guys, one, as they're there, this is the Bema seat rewards. The first guy was given five talents. He brings to Jesus five more. And he says, well done, thy good and faithful servants. As you see this in the talents, it's told in two places. It's told in Matthew, and it's told also in Luke. And you'll see that there's rewards that are given out here. And you'll hear that you'll be over so many cities if you put Luke together with Matthew. and You read the whole part of it. So we go from the rapture to a wedding banquet, and in the wedding banquet, the, we bring gifts, but at the wedding banquet that Jesus does, he hands out gifts. He hands out the rewards, and he's going to bless those. Now, you get down to the last one that has one talent, and he hid it. He's not actually there in heaven. It's just to teach what took place, why he really doesn't make it. Because he didn't trust God with what God gave him. He hid it. So there isn't someone in heaven that's getting thrown out that he got raptured. And he goes, what? I got raptured and I'm up here. I don't make it. And I go, that's not, don't be literal, literal. The teaching goes with how do you get these rewards? Be faithful with what you gave you. And let, let me tell you this. In our world, God has allowed those that has the one talent, and the talent is actually money. But if you say, I only have one physical talent, I only have a little bit of money. Those that do something with it, we make great movies out of. We don't make them out of the ones that already had five or had two or have a lot. We make it out of the one. So he's not telling you the one person can't get to heaven. He's telling you, you can't get there if you don't trust him with what little you have. 
So again, it looks like it falls out because you go, that, is it, we, we see that in heaven? No, that's being too literal. It's a parable teaching about how you get there and what could happen. Okay? So, then the last parable, the parable, all these three are in Matthew 25. The last parable here, the parable of, of the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25, 31 through 46. If you start with even the first verse, as a matter of fact, if you're in Matthew 25, let's look at the very first verse. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all his angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. When he comes, this is not in the air, he's coming down to sit on his throne. What throne? It's actually David's throne. The angel told Mary, and your son will reign on David's throne. This is the second coming. That's what the sheep and goats parable is all about. So, dealing with just Matthew 25, 50% of those that think they're all going to go to heaven because God just loves us and, and we've loved him, and we're not really that bad. We have self-righteousness. We're like the parable of the, the wedding banquet that they refuse to go to. We, the, those that refuse to to trust the word of God are still dressed in their own self-righteousness. See how all these come together? That parable says 50% of them won't enter in on the rapture. When we get into the rapture, there's a wedding banquet and there's rewards that's going to be given out. Then there's a time period out here that he's coming at the end of the seven years and he's coming with what you just heard in verse 31 with tens of thousands of angels, and he's coming to rule on the earth for a thousand years. And he's going to put people on his left and people on his right. And he's going to say to the sheep, when I was naked, when I was hungry, when I was in prison, you came and visit me. And they said, when do we see you? He says, when you've done it to one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine. Listen to how the church always takes a prophetic scripture and twists it. They twist it. Those that don't understand prophecy twist it in this way. So today, most churches, they boast about how well they're doing in feeding the least of these or going to prison and feeding those and clothing those. Should we do those things? Yeah, because we're Christians we do that. Is that how you get to heaven? No. They twist it and go, well, it says that if we don't do that, we don't get to heaven. We, we get put over here with the goats. No, he says, as you've done it unto the least of these, my brothers and sisters. He's talking about those that were here on the planet. They didn't what? When they got, they didn't take the mark even. They're at the end of the seven-year tribulation. But they didn't help their other brother and sister when they needed it the most. They just fend it for themselves. And he says, when you, you, you saw me and you didn't do it unto me. This is not about a benevolence program in the here and now. This is telling you how the judgment, before we go into that thousand year reign, he's going to take all those that were not there to help the brothers and sisters as if they're helping Christ He's going to put them on the side and say, you're the goats, and you don't go into millennial reign. You need to read that passage and see what you see, need to see there. Put the connection. Christians should do benevolent things. Don't get me wrong. There's some that are going to say, oh, he doesn't even want to help the poor. Yeah, we, 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 we're going to take up more offerings for, for the orphanages out there in Ukraine. We've already done I've sent, you've already sent it in, we've done it on things, we're going to do it more as the time goes on. As the need is not going away, we will continue to help the poor. That's why we give the missions, is because we help the poor around the world. That's not speaking about that in this parable. It's speaking about the seven-year period when you did, didn't do it unto my brothers and sisters. If you're in a church that doesn't speak on these things, get out of that church and find a church close enough that you can get to. Continue to watch online churches that will share these things and start getting the Word of God yourself. We have these that we've been handing out. They're to help you become a person as you read the Scripture, answer the question. You say, well, 
how do I know how to answer it? Pray and let the Holy Spirit show you. Read what it says before that scripture. Read what it says after it. Let the Holy Spirit teach you the word of God. There's a promise in the scripture that he is the teacher. Amen? So all you have to do is put in 909-637-3339 and put journey. This is the basic beginning one. And then if you want to move on to the things of the spirit, this is the journey too. You got to put your name and address. When you text to that, it's going to send you something back. You got to put your name and address when you put in, I want journey one or journey two. You can ask for both. We'll send them to you. You can come up and get them if you haven't gotten them here yet.